permit me to express my very deep appreciation to the Governing Council and Senate of the University of Lagos for this honor of the invitation to deliver the Convocation Lecture at the 50th anniversary of our university. We must, of course, congratulate the university, its management, its staff, students and alumni on this special season of the celebration of our Golden Jubilee. The university has, in the past 50 years, become undoubtedly the premier institution of higher education in Nigeria. <laughs> by far, by far, the first amongst equals. For this, for this, we owe a debt of gratitude to the excellent academics, the administrators, students, whose talents and innovation and commitment to learning through the years have put this place on the enviable pedestal on which it stands today. Being here for me is, of, is doubly pleasurable. Aside from the privilege of being invited to speak at this historic ceremony, is also, as you've heard, a homecoming for me. I graduated here in 1975, and I was engaged as a lecturer in the Faculty of Law in November 1981, about 38 years or so ago. It was here that my worldview was birthed and honed, my positions on public and social justice, my skepticism about some of the purest and allegedly sacrosanct economic ideologies, my belief that the dynamism and the immeasurable potential of humankind informs that the most crucial pillar of government's economic policies must be on how to improve the quality of human resources. I suspect that the choice of the subject of this lecture, Nigeria Rising, the Path to Prosperity, was informed by the curiosity of the university about what to expect from the Buhari administration in the next four years, or what is the meaning of that uh, uh, expression that for some is cryptic, the next level. <laughs> I, will, I will speak to this in several parts and convince you that it was not just an electioneering slogan. Perhaps I may begin by affirming the belief of the Buhari administration that Nigeria's prosperity means a decent existence for all. Second, that that prosperity so defined will be attained if we're able to address the issues of extreme poverty, productivity, corruption, the rule of law, the deficiencies in the quality of human resources caused by poor education and healthcare. The last point is possibly the most fundamental, how to ensure that we maximize the potential of the abundant human resources that we have. This implies that we must have a robust enough healthcare system that ensures that the average person is in good health. An educational system that guarantees education capable of preparing children for the opportunities and challenges of a knowledge economy. A thriving private sector which leads the economic activities of the country supported by a business-friendly environment. A system of wealth creation, especially wealth creation options and safety nets, capable of taking millions out of poverty and providing for those who cannot work. The wealth creation options must include access to cheap credit for smallholder farmers, for traders and artisans. The safety nets must include government-created schemes for the unemployed, and cash transfers for the poorest and the most vulnerable. In planning the path to prosperity, we also took into account, and I speak now about our plans, especially in the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, we took into account the age-old weaknesses of the Nigerian economy and the illusion of prosperity that frequently distorts our understanding of the actual fragility of our economy. First is the focus on GDP growth figures without a clear understanding of the underlying dynamic. 
60% of GDP growth is dependent on oil revenues. 60% of the GDP figures that we see is actually dependent on oil revenues. How? While the oil sector itself contributes just 8 to 12% of the total GDP, the non-oil sector contributes something in the range of 80 to 90% of GDP. However, between 50 and 53% of the non-oil sector is actually dependent on the fortunes of the oil sector. In other words, despite the fact that the oil sector contributes so little to GDP because it creates very few jobs, it actually controls the rest of the size of the GDP because everything practically depends on our revenues from oil. This means that our economy rests on a tripod where two of the three legs are dependent on highly volatile oil prices and production. Now, this shaky economic structure enabled Nigeria to keep growing as long as oil revenues and foreign reserves were high enough. And of course, you know, we frequently celebrated uh, this fragile growth structure. By the very nature of extractive industries, high oil revenues does not mean more jobs or even better human development indices. Jobs are only created where some value is added. So, for example, you know, when we had the highest amounts, when we had the highest oil figures, the highest figures from oil revenues, the highest figures from oil production, who at the same time had the highest levels of poverty, at the same time the highest levels of debt, at the same time high levels of unemployment. Because the oil industry by itself, without adding value, does not create jobs and doesn't even create opportunities. So a thriving petrochemical industry, for example, would have created the jobs, would create jobs directly from oil and gas. The economy our economy had also been running on a consumption growth model, which is only advantageous if consumption is being met by domestic production of goods and services. However, our structure was based on consumption of large portions of imports. As long as there was plenty of oil-based foreign exchange in our reserves to import and fuel consumption, our economy kept growing in GDP terms but few jobs were being created and more people were actually going into poverty. The majority of the affluent, those who are considered affluent in this economic scenario, are the professionals, the financial uh, services intermediaries, banks and uh, bank employees and directors, etc., contractors and others who are able to plug into the rent-seeking opportunities that are created when the biggest business is government-owned. And just to explain that very quickly, those who benefit when there is high oil revenues and there is no real productivity are the essentially the service sector and, of course, contractors and persons who can find themselves into the rent seeking, into any of the rent seeking opportunities presented by high oil prices. Very few other people can profit. So the rich in, 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 that, in, in that situation are persons who have the advantage of knowing people in government who can, who can get contracts, because government, of course, is always the biggest uh, supplier of, of this, the biggest supplier of the contracts and of all the opportunities. And that's why at a point in time, you know, somebody commented that we we're doing very well as an economy because on one occasion, uh, 35 Nigerians flew in jets into Kenya for a, particular, for a particular ceremony in Kenya because people had jets, because many people had uh, jets. There was a suggestion, of that there was some impression created that indeed our country is an affluent country. But the truth of the matter is that underlying the jets, of course, is no productivity whatsoever because the owners of the jets are contractors and government, uh, friends of those in government. And you could not really tie the ownership of the jets and ownership of these kinds of luxury assets to any kind of productivity. The productive sector, the real manufacturers, the value-adding businesses have always been relatively few. The source of the income coming to this class of individuals, and I refer now 
to not the manufacturers but for the contractors is from oil revenue. When oil revenues fall, not only does GDP growth fall, but this most affluent but unproductive sector suffers. Also in understanding some of the problems of the Nigerian economy, the place of corruption, especially grand corruption, is also crucial. The same oil earnings which are meant to develop infrastructure, to fund education and healthcare, end up in private pockets. The feeding frenzy is worse in times of high oil earnings. A combination of theft of public revenues and the consequent failure to invest in infrastructure, as well as a largely rentier or rent-seeking business class, is what accounts for Nigeria's economic quagmire. The other problem is a problem of extreme poverty. And I think it's important to continue to underscore the fact that our major problem has always been grand corruption, the direct stealing of government resources. I keep emphasizing, every time I emphasize it, there is a headline in the newspaper, Yemi Oshibajo blames previous governments. It's always a headline. But I do not mind repeating it ad nauseum, because it's the truth. And we must not allow it to happen again. And we must not allow it to happen again. Because there are very few people who understand how badly the fact that somebody can sign a check and take money out of the treasury, any amount of money, how that affects our capacity to do even the most basic things, to provide the most basic services to our people. The kind of, the kind of high level corruption, corruption on the size that diminishes, that diminishes the public revenue so substantially that you're on, almost unable to do anything is what we have experienced in, in our country. And it must never happen again. It was clear to us, it was clear to us that we needed to devise an economic plan, you know, which would, one, prioritize the building of infrastructure, especially rail, roads, power, and ports. Two, productivity. Productivity had to be our guiding principle as we diversify the economy from oil and gas. Three, the fight against corruption, especially public sector corruption. Four, developing a new educational curriculum that emphasizes science, technology, engineering, arts and maths, and also emphasizes some of those critical skills needed for the jobs of the 21st century. Five, a new approach to resourcing healthcare. Six, a social investment program that deals with issues of extreme poverty and unemployment. The Economic Recovery and Growth Plan effectively addressed many of these issues that I've mentioned. So the question is so far, how, how far have we gone and what is the next level? We believe that creating an environment for productive investment, for productivity, thank your pardon, and investment is extremely important. And that environment is one which is both in terms of hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. Soft infrastructure covers the whole gamut of the regulatory environment for business. Hard infrastructure is where we, fo where we focus on economically strategic roads, rail, power, ports across the country. Roads and rail linking important commercial centers are prioritized. As of today, in two budget cycles, we have spent uh, an aggregate of 2.7 trillion naira on capital, which is the highest ever in the history of the country. We have recently commissioned, and I'm sure many would have followed that, the Lagos Abekuta Ibado end of the new standard gauge Lagos Kano Railway. That rail originates from the Apapa port, which means that very soon cargo will be moving from uh, the port by rail out to the hinterland and of course out all the way to the north. This will significantly ameliorate the congestion that we're experiencing in the port. Expanding, expanding the facilities of the port was always going to be a very important issue. Our port has the capacity for 34 million metric tons of cargo, but today it does 86 million metric tons of cargo, several times higher than its capacity. And so we are currently dredging the worry port as part of the uh, effort to reduce the congestion at the Lagos port. 
in Lagos, we're also working on the private sector-led uh, uh, port, the Lekki port, and also the Badaki port, has attracted significant foreign capital and interest. In Abuja, after almost 15 years, we've completed uh, and commissioned the Abuja light rail project, starting from the airport to the city center. Similarly, we completed and commissioned the Abuja Kaduna Railway. The Itakwe Wari Railway has also been completed, linking the iron ore deposits to the Wari port. Here in the southwest of Nigeria, work is going on, as uh, many would know, on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, the Lagos Ota Abekuta Expressway, the Ikorodu Shagama Road, and the Obumashoe Elori Road. The contract uh, uh, for the Lagos Expressway, the Lagos uh, Badagri Expressway, uh, was awarded about two months ago, and work uh, should begin very shortly. On power, we've moved generation from 4,000 to 8,100 megawatts of power. But the effect of this increase in generation has not translated significantly to better service to the consumer. Now, this is mainly due to two factors. The first is transmission challenges. The second is distribution. Over 2,000 megawatts of power is not today being taken up by the discos for distribution to consumers, largely because of the problems they experience in collection of tariffs. One of the reasons for this is that the discos themselves have not invested in metering, which is why you get uh, estimated billings uh, and, those kinds, uh, and those kinds of things. The truth is that when the uh, privatization was done, the privatization of the power sector was done, a lot of those who invested in the discos in particular thought that this would be uh, the, one of the more generous uh, experiences like the telcos where money was made very quickly. As it turned out, the money wasn't forthcoming and many of them are heavily indebted and have been unable to provide, as they should, meters and other distribution assets. This has significantly delayed the, the, uh, the, the, the production of power, the, the supply of power, especially to the, to the, uh, mile, the last mile, to the uh, consumers. So, we've, so what we've done is that we've embarked now on a major metering initiative the metering assets program, which involves private metering asset providers. So we're no longer relying on the discos to meter. We are now, we've now uh, aggregated a group of uh, meter providers who will provide meters as their own business. And in addition, the federal government has in the past 18 months taken on the deficiencies in transmission through the TCN and the uh, Niger Delta Power Holding Company. We are completing transmission projects all over the country. But the more important strategy is to decentralize power production. So we've adopted an off-grid program, which means, that, which means that we are encouraging private investors to collaborate with government to build IPPs, those are independent power plants, and supply power to willing, to willing buyers. This was made possible by what is called an eligible customer declaration by the Ministry of Power, Works and Housing. By this collaboration, we have been providing power through private sector providers, especially solar power, to economic clusters such as markets across the country, including the Ariaria market in Aba, where over 31,993 shops have been provided with uh, power. There's both a solar power plant there and a thermal power plant, and these are privately provided uh, powers, uh, pri privately provided power. Sabongari market in Kano as well, 13,598 shops in that uh, market, that's also privately provided. Sura market in Lagos, over 1,000 odd shops. Isiko market, Nepa 1 and 2 in Ondo, and Bagi market uh, in Oyo State, about uh, under 8,000 shops or so. UMBC, about 2,000 shops. And a total, so far, of almost, uh, I think, when, when you total the number of shops, something in the order of about 150,000 or so. Now, this is experimental in the sense that we are working on a situation where private sector power providers 
can take over portions of territory and provide power to those who are willing uh, to pay for such power. Now, practically everybody will be willing to pay for the power if they are metered. And of course, if these uh, meters are prepaid meters, and we think that in, you know, the next iteration of the power sector reform would involve several more power providers, especially discos, taking on territory across the country while we improve supply from the grid. In Lagos, uh, as I said, we recently commissioned the, Sul uh, the Sura uh, solar project. The businesses there now have power around the clock, from printers to commercial tailors to small shop businesses. Everyone is employing more and making more profit. The next level, of course, is to ensure completion of the major infrastructure projects. The main drawback is funding. And so we established recently the Presidential Infrastructure Development Fund. This Infrastructure Development Fund is both a private sector and a public sector fund. So we're taking funds from the World Bank, from the AFDP, AFDB, from private uh, fund uh, operators, and we are also contributing to the federal government. And this is what we're using to fund the second Niger Bridge, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, and the Mambila Hydro Project, the Abuja Kano Expressway, and the East West Road. These are all projects that are funded by the Presidential Infrastructure Fund. One of the major problems with a lot of our infrastructure projects and why they remain abandoned is because we simply don't have the resources starting out. And so, after some budget funding has been provided, many of those projects just remain idle for, for years. This is why the, the Presidential Infrastructure Fund initiative is a very important one, because we provide the funding before the projects uh, begin. If we stick to this agenda, my view is that in the next two years, we will see the most significant improvements in our power sector in particular, in our history. I'm quite convinced that we're well on the path to doing so. Industrial infrastructure is a major component of our economic transformation plan. We have what is called Project Mine, made in Nigeria for export. This is the major plank of our industrial policy. The idea is to build special economic zones which accommodate industries for local manufacture of goods for which Nigeria has a comparative advantage. These include cotton, garments, leatherware, etc. We set up the Nigerian EZ Investment Company, that's the Nigerian Economic Zones Investment Company, a public-private partnership, which, and this is the delivery vehicle for the project. The objectives are to boost manufacturing share of GDP to 20% and make Nigeria the leading regional manufacturing hub for sub-Saharan Africa, to create about 1.5 million new jobs in manufacturing, and to generate about $30 billion in non-oil export earnings annually to improve the utilization of Nigeria's resources and comparative advantage whilst creating a strong domestic uh, value chain. We also want to create local models of global best practice in industrial infrastructure and the enabling business environment. Already work has begun in three locations for these special economic zones. The first is the Eimba Economic City in Aba. This covers over 9,500 hectares just outside Aba in Abia State. Master planning, feasibility studies, and detailed design have been completed for phase one. Three international anchor tenants have been secured, and the city will be served by an already existing IPP for power, which, and it will create about 62,000, 62, uh, 625,000 jobs when fully built. There's also the Lekki Model Industrial Park, and this is what we're doing in partnership with the Lagos State Government. It is set on 1,000 hectares in the northeast cluster of the Lekki Free Zone. It has already attracted world-class anchor tenants for textile, garments, agri-processing, and light manufacturing, including the number one uh, Chinese and the number nine global textile and garment group. They are the anchor tenants for, for, uh, for that Lekki project uh, with the Lagos State Government. The proximity of that project to the petrochemical feedstock from the Dangote refinery for synthetic textiles and garment manufacturing makes the park really attractive for investors. 
So we expect that, you know, just as the Dangote refinery uh, is going on our pace, of course, we know that the refinery also has uh, a fertilizer plant tied to it, the largest single line fertilizer plant in the world. That makes it very attractive for those uh, who, of course, need the petro petrochemical products in the industrial park. The third project is in, the early, is in its early stages. This is the Fontua Cotton Cluster in Katsina State. Fontua has the largest aggregation of cotton generis in Nigeria, and the cluster will aggregate cotton from 800,000 farmers in northern Nigeria. And it will, be, it will be the largest integrated cotton ginning, spinning, and weaving complex in sub-Saharan Africa. It will establish the cotton value chain from seed cotton to finished fabric and provide feedstock for domestic and export-oriented garment manufacturing. We believe that the future for job creation and efficient and profitable businesses lie in innovation and technology. Innovation and technology is absolutely crucial, especially when we look at the future and not just at the number of young men and women coming out of school, the number of uh, the, 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 the sheer numbers of those who need uh, to be employed and the sheer number of those who need to be fed. We've partnered with local and international tech companies and innovators in the building of tech hubs and promoting innovation. Our aim is to completely democratize access to innovation and cyber commerce and create jobs. We've established hubs in collaboration with the World Bank and the Lagos Business School. We have the Climate Change Innovation Hub, now at the Lagos Business School. In Yola, we have the Northeast Humanitarian Hub, uh, and which uh, was established also last year. We also have, in collaboration with Civic Hub, uh, we promoted a technology and innovation hub in uh, technology and innovation in several universities. The Students Challenge. We launched one here. We launched one of the Students Challenges here, and in six other uh, of the other geopolitical zones. Now, just this morning, I inspected uh, the technology hub, which is being built in partnership with the Bank of Industry, the Civic Hub, and the federal government. And we expect that in the next two months that hub should be ready for the use of uh, University of Lagos uh, innovators and tech -preneurs. The Bank of Industry, in response to the direction set by the government, has launched a 10 billion Naira tech fund. And I've personally visited several technology hubs across the country and several new technology businesses. It's very obvious that there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of innovation that's going on in technology in Nigeria. And one of the major requirements, of course, is funding, which is why uh, we are leveraging on what uh, the Bank of Industry is doing. And we're also creating the Nigerian Enterprise Bank in, uh, with the CBN, with the Central Bank of Nigeria. We believe that the Nigerian Enterprise Bank is an important addition to what the Bank of Industry is doing. But it will focus, the, the Enterprise Bank or the Entrepreneur Bank will focus on startups, on new businesses. And the idea will be to fund these new businesses from startup to the point where they're able to go on their own. It's very clear that already so much is going on and so many uh, technology businesses in Nigeria are able to attract even funding, not just locally, but internationally. And just to give you a few examples, Paystack, I'm sure some of us have heard of Paystack, is a safe payment system which offers seamless money transactions between businesses and their customers. It was established in 2016 by two young Nigerians, alumni of Babcock uh, University. Within the, and within the first three months of 2018, they processed over 3 billion Naira, and they already generate about 40 billion annually for Nigerian businesses. The company, that company alone, is today powering over 9,000 businesses that did not exist two years ago, creating over 25,000 jobs. Paystack, Paystack, that one company, has by itself just 50 uh, employees. All of them are under 35 years old. All of the employees are under 35. There's also, there's also Andela. I'm sure some of us have heard of Andela, a multinational company 
which specializes in training software developers. Again, co-founded by a Nigerian, a young Nigerian who is, I, I believe, even now under 30, in Aboyeji. The company estimates that in the next 10 years, there will be 1.3 million software development jobs, 1.3 million software development jobs available in this country, and only 40,000 40, computer science graduates to fill them. In other words, we'll actually have a situation where we have far too many jobs in that sector and very few individuals to fill them. So their vision is to uh, ensure that they're able to train the number of software developers that will be able to fill in that gap. So today, the company has over a thousand employees worldwide, and it's very clear that this is the direction that several of these small companies, and there's so many of them, and I, I had uh, the uh, opportunity of visiting several of them here in Lagos, some in Enugu, and practically all across the country. Our technology agenda is premised on our new education curriculum, and I might speak briefly about it uh, before I round this up. This new education curriculum is one which emphasizes science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. We are currently developing that curriculum with the support of global players like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cisco, IBM, and Oracle. A nationwide curriculum, this curriculum we expect, is one that will incorporate 21st century STEM thinking. We, we, we call our STEAM because we've added arts to it. Coding, design skills, digital arts, robotics, machine learning, and so on. The curriculum will cover primary to secondary education with the skills to, you know, with the skills that will be relevant for the sub sorts of jobs that will be created, in the, that are being created today and that will be created in the future. The arts component of that vision is extremely important. Visual arts, dance, music, film and theatre, comedy, literature, these and many more are fields in which Nigeria has proved to the world that we have the talent, the originality, and the ambition. So today, uh, opportunities are being created practically all around in entertainment and in the arts. And it is, of course, uh, the business of government to see that we support that in every way. And this is why uh, the president asked that we constitute a, uh, a technology and entertainment advisory group. The Technology and Entertainment Advisory Group is part of our Industrial and Competitiveness Council. So we have uh, a large number of very young people who are involved in entertainment and who are involved in technology, who now support us and who give advice on you know, the new policies that we should adopt for entertainment and technology. And the advice is particularly important because, for example, we've discovered that a lot of the banks, you know, who are jittery about fintech companies. And many of these fintech companies, of course, are the very forward-looking companies set up by young men and women, Paystack and Co. are these fintech companies. And the banks were jittery. But these people were able to do financial transactions without banking licenses. And they were able to do so across, uh, across the world. So there was a need for us to rethink the, uh, our policy, especially with the granting of licenses or banking licenses, and what sorts of licenses to grant to fintech companies. And it's to the credit of the technology advisory group of these young men and women that have been able to develop a policy that enables the fintech companies to be given licenses that are not quite banking licenses, but enable them to do their work without hindrance. Nigeria has also made appreciable progress uh, in improving our business environment. Uh, we improved our position in the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings by 24 places over a three-year period, and we are judged one of the 10 best reforming economies in the world. And that, uh, and that, um, when, when, when I said so at a gathering where a lot, of our, uh, a lot of my political opponents in the PDP were, you know, they didn't know whether to clap or to frown, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm told, you know, even today, um, there is, of course, an increased presence of, uh, of foreign companies coming into the country. 
I think that Nigeria has always remained a, and has always been and remains an attractive place for foreign investment. Of course, the better, a more business friendly environment means that will attract uh, uh, more foreign investment in the country. Today, there are definitely more Japanese companies, and uh, we have confirmation of that, and that has increased by at least 25% over the past three years. From Norway, then the number of companies have also doubled. Allianz, the largest insurance company in the world, has started operations in Nigeria after buying into a local firm. While Coca-Cola, I'm sure we all know, has bought up the remaining shares in Chi Industries that it did not own. For those of us who are watching the environment, we know that uh, smart money always uh, follows what appears to be uh, good news in, in the business environment. But what kind of reforms are expected in the business sector in the next four years and in which sectors? The first is that we will complete the concessioning of our airports for increased efficiency and alignment with global standards. It's very clear that the public sector should not run airports. As a matter of fact, the public sector, the government, should not run any business at all. It should be left to the private sector. The second, the second is to establish a national trading platform to encompass a more sophisticated single window platform. Now, the national trading platform is very important because this really is at the heart of our import and export, the movement of, of goods and services across our borders, across our ports. Now we want to have a single platform through which all of this happens. This is what we've called the National Trading Platform, and it will include a ports community portal for goods being imported and exported out of the country. The third is that the National Assembly will make history with the passage and repeal and the reenactment of the Companies and Allied Matters Act, which is the biggest business reform bill in Nigeria in the past 28 years. This government bill introduces new provisions for single member companies, for limited liability uh, partnerships, for company rescue provisions, for optim op optional use of, uh, of common seals, introduction of e-signatures for business registration, etc. It is uh, going to be a very revolutionary amendment of the Companies and Allied Matters Act. The fourth is that we are positioning our regulatory agencies to serve as business facilitators as opposed to obstacles to business. We will broaden the current pilot regulatory reforms, the National Food and uh, Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAQ, and the National Insurance Company and other regulatory agencies. What has happened in the past is that those who have had to deal with these regulatory agencies have found them to be more obstacles than actual facilitators of business. With what we've called our MSME clinics, where we've taken the regulators to meet with uh, the MSMEs themselves, we're trying to reform the way that our regulators operate so that they see themselves as facilitators of the businesses that they regulate as opposed to uh, obstacles to those businesses. We're also working on the omnibus bill on business facilitation as a first of its kind in Nigeria. This bill is aimed at being a single encompassing bill to institutionalize some of the business climate reforms already achieved by PEBEC, that's the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council. We are amending some provisions of the present legislative framework that have been identified as bottlenecks to the business climate reforms, and we're introducing new reforms that will accentuate the business climate. So what we're, so what we're seeing here is one single law, a single uh, legislation, which will address a lot of the concerns that many have in the business environment. So rather than you know, uh, several different laws, we're doing one omnibus bill that will take into account several of the different problems that, several, that people have expressed about our business environment. Agriculture, and um, I'm going to go very quickly because I see that um, uh, people are getting a bit uh, sleepy. <laughs> Agriculture has been a major success story. Oh, I see that you're all awake. Agriculture has been a major success story for us. And, uh, of course, there are several constraints, but with increased budget reallocation from uh, 2015, where 
we, where the entire budget allocation for agriculture was 8.8 .8 billion to 46.2 billion in 2016 and 103.8 billion in 2018. So agriculture has grown by 14.27 percent, especially in, in 2018. Through what we call the Anchor Borrowers Program, we've been able to give credit directly to smallholder farmers, and this is done through the CBN and, then, and 13 participating banks. So far, credit totaling about 120.6 billion naira has been given to almost a million smallholder farms cultivating 12 commodities, including rice, wheat, cotton, soya beans, cassava, poultry, and groundnuts across the 36 states of the Federation. In addition, we launched a fertilizer program to improve local blending capacity in collaboration with Morocco. Today, we have 11 fertilizer blending plants with a capacity of 2.1 million. Price of fertilizer, as you know, for those who farm has dropped from about 13,000 uh, for the 50 kg bag to now between 5,500 and 6,000. The, 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 the importance of the fertilizer uh, program is that it, we are now in a position where we are able to produce as much fertilizer as we need. And what is more, we are also able to use, that, uh, to use the type of fertilizer that is applicable to the type of soil where that, 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 that requires it. So we are not just using one fertilizer fits all. We actually do the test to be sure that the type of soil, that is, uh, the type of fertilizer that is required for the type of soil is what we, is what we use. The Anchor Borrowers Program itself is now digitalized with all farmlands, uh, GPRS mapped, biometric data of farmers is captured, electronic cards issued, and specific inputs are checked. This has enhanced traceability and has also enhanced productivity and yield. Today, but for a few drawbacks, we are confidently approaching self-sufficiency in rice production. From importing $5 million of rice daily, official imports are now down to 2%. We have opened up opportunities for greater entrepreneurial activity in the sector. And there is far greater investment in value-added services, value services in that value chain. In the last three years, more young entrepreneurs have taken to agriculture and have taken advantage of the massive market for food and agri uh, for food and agricultural commodities, and they're doing well at it. I'll just give one or two examples. There's a company called Farm Crowding, a, a company established by uh, two young Nigerians. It's a digital agriculture portal that crowdsources funding for farms across Nigeria. It was founded by Onyeka Akuma in 2016 and three other young Nigerians. It actually works like a mutual fund. So what they do is that they pull together money from multiple investors to establish farms and to hire uh, smallholder farmers and uh, they, they hire smallholder farms to cultivate those farms. And then they pay their investors dividends from the harvest from these farms. In December 2017, they raised a million dollars in funding and they have also raised, uh, since then, they've raised uh, some more local funding. I believe now they have clientele in excess of 100,000 investors. Farm Crowded, uh, and that's Farm Crowded, but in 2012, another uh, company like that uh, uh, was founded. I think, no, I think, sorry, I said 2016, another company like that was founded, Sultry. The name of the company is Sultry, founded by a lady called Yemisi Iraloe. This is a cassava, what she did is a cassava processing company in the town of Aduawaye in southern Nigeria, southwest Nigeria, more than 200 kilometers from Lagos. The first assembly plant, amongst a total of six to operate, is to assemble tractors and implements and to be located in Bauchi State in an already existing facility owned by a private operator. It is projected that almost 5,000 tractors will be assembled every year. 
Now there will also be service centers. There will be a total of 780 service centers spread out across the local government areas in the states and the federal capital territory. What the service center will offer is a technology package consisting of machinery and equipment. And the machinery, of course, will be agricultural, mechanization, of course, it can be rented, rental tractors, etc. There will also be quality inputs, improved seedlings, uh, fertilizers, and pesticides. In each of those service centers, there will also be technical assistance and training for smallholder farmers in order to ensure consistent results in productivity and the quality of agricultural produce. The service center will also be, will perform an important market function. It will be able to aggregate primary produce for uh, processing and haul it to markets. So this establishes a means for monetizing the entire process and for loan repayment based on a percentage of agricultural production. 109 of these service centers will be located in the, in the 109 senatorial districts as process service centers. And the process service centers will, in addition uh, to already mentioned services, have processors which serve as a throughput from which value can be added to their cultural produce brought in by local farmers. Service centers will be based on the comparative and complementary advantage of each location. Now, the, the most uh, important aspect of this particular project is that it is a comprehensive project for transforming uh, Nigeria from the type of farming which we've seen to a thoroughly, uh, to, to, to a thoroughly mechanized system of, of agriculture. And we're working with the Brazilian government who are uh, investing a billion US dollars over the, uh, over the period of the project in bringing in equipment which will, as I've said, will be locally assembled. And the equipment will be in various service centers. The farmers will be able to hire tractors. They'll be able to hire mechanized equipment from these service centers. And they, of course, will not need to buy them. But the most important part of it is that the entire value chain will be covered. Grains and cereal, livestock, poultry, fruits, roots, tubers, practically everything, the, the entire value chain. We're also going to be using young technicians from the Empire Agro Program. They will join the technical staff of the service centers. And of course, uh, they, they will be involved in extension planning, etc. We think that this project is particularly important, especially for the next phase of our, of, of our, agricultural, of our agricultural program. So I, I would skip uh, the impact. I think I've already made the, the point about the impact. But agriculture, as, as I've said, is extremely important uh, going forward. Now, I, I think that I should just very briefly talk about uh, our social investment program, just to underscore uh, some of the very important issues uh, that underscore our planning, uh, that, 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 that undergird our planning for bringing many out of poverty and for ensuring that we are able to provide a decent existence for as many Nigerians as possible. Our social investment program is the largest and most ambitious social program, uh, possibly in the history, in, in our history certainly. But you will, we, we've seen that aspects of it are some of the largest anywhere on the continent. We provided 500 billion for the social investment project in 2016 and 2017. But the total spend is closer to possibly about 200, 250 billion from both budgets. The program has four components. The first is the MPAR program, our graduate employment scheme, which, uh, where we employ 500,000 graduates. Many of these graduates have been recruited as teachers, as cultural extension workers, and as public health workers. Each of these volunteers, the first 250,000 of them, have been provided with an electronic tablet, such as the one that I have here. And it contains relevant training materials, including some uh, materials which are used to train on, you know, on an ongoing basis. Uh, so they have on, on, they have on those, uh, uh, they have in, uh, in those tablets, they have uh, entrepreneurial training, uh, some computer skills training, 
uh, coding, some digital literacy training and all of that. These are meant to be material that would help the, uh, the volunteers or the beneficiaries of the scheme to develop themselves even as they work and earn some money. The device also uh, empowers them to participate in the digital economy as data collectors and as analysts. One of the reasons why we thought that this program is very important is because every year 1.7 new entrants come into the job market every single year, 1.7 million. In order to prevent a situation where we simply have a major crisis on our hands, of course government must provide some jobs to fill in the gap. Now, we expect that it is industry, we expect that it is business that will provide the jobs that will sustain, uh, that will sustain our economy going forward. But it's impossible to deal with the numbers if we're expecting industry to provide all of those jobs because it will take a while for industry people to provide the jobs. That's the reason why the, uh, the Empire program was created to fill in that gap. So we employ 500,000 for a start, and we're looking at employing a further 500,000 to, uh, for him to, to, to make that a million in order to be able to bridge that gap as much as possible for, it, for a two-year period, and then, of course, it can be extended as we go further. But we believe that it is the, that government must provide some employment opportunities that it pays for and, as it, and of course as it provides that opportunity they also, we also train those that we provide the opportunities for in order to ensure that we don't have a situation where far too many people are out there on the job market. There's also the Government Enterprises and Empowerment Program. These are interest-free loans ranging from 50,000 to 350,000 disbursed so far to more than 400,000 market women, traders, artisans, farmers across the 36 states of the country and the FCT. 56% of the loans have gone to women. Now, aside from that program, we have the Trader Money Program. It's an important component of giving microcredit to the bottom of the trading pyramid, the smallest businesses, the one-table trader, the bread seller, the plantain seller, the meshai or mesuya and all of those kinds of people who, whose inventory is usually no more than about 1,500, 2,000 naira. This is the largest segment of our trading population in Nigeria. Is that the largest segment, that the largest number. They are an important part of the value chain for most goods. They sell the single sachets of soap, of sugar, spices to the largest numbers of our people but they are forgotten and they are ignored in the economic plans and budgets. And they are considered too unwieldy and too risky for microcredit loans. Under that scheme, we've been able to give microcredit to two million petty traders across the country so far. <laughs> the and how it works is that, of course, it's a scheme run by the Bank of Industry. The Bank of Industry uh, enumerates those who get the loans and they are given 10,000 naira in the first uh, place. When they pay back within a six month period, they are given 15,000. When they pay back, they are given 20. And it goes all the way up to 100,000 naira. Now, it is, uh, I've, uh, you know, sometimes you hear people ask you, what can 10,000 naira do? You know, obviously, such people, you know, haven't seen the things that um, some of us have seen very clear that if you look at the average petty trader, you know, most of them, I mean, if you look at somebody who is selling plantain, their inventory is not even up to 2,000, 3,000 naira. Somebody who is selling uh, ground nuts or selling some, you know, small stuff, usually the inventory is so small. I, I, I was at uh, a Yaya market in, in Abuja. And I was speaking to a, a woman who was selling her pomo in a bucket. You know, she had all her pomo in one bucket, water, you know, of course there was water in it, so she put her pomo in it. And I asked her, how much is all of this? She said, about 3,500 or so. So I said, how do you make money from this? She didn't even answer. She just pointed to the woman standing next to her, whose pomo was in a little bowl. You know, so... And what she was telling me is that, look, 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 I'm a big player here, you know, this is, look at what this, 
and 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 that's the and that is the story and that's the story across the country we need to there's no way that we can take people out of poverty without giving them the resources to come out of poverty we must give them resources so that they can improve on their inventory sell more make more money for themselves and be able to you know climb up that ladder the, the examples we've seen of the countries across the world that have taken their people out of poverty have used the same methods India is one good example today where, where India has outstripped us India used to have the largest number of poor people now we have the largest number because India has been able to you know move ahead of us it is not because and it's not because we are not, it's not because we do not know what to do. It's because we haven't done what we need to do. When in, when in 2012 we were making tons of money, we had 112 million poor people. India at the time started this sort of programs, these so social investment programs that we're doing now. They started giving credit, conditional cash transfers and credit to the poorest. And gradually, these people came out. In fact, what they are giving is much less than what we are giving. It's much less than ten thousand. Some at some point they were giving something in the order of about twenty dollars or fifteen dollars or so. And yet, you know, people were coming out of poverty. So that we must address the questions of poverty that con because this is what affects the largest numbers of our people. So this program has led to one of the most successful financial outcomes. Uh, 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 financial inclusion outcomes, the opening of several new bank accounts, wallets for beneficiaries, intended beneficiaries, etc. Again, we have as part of our social investment program, uh, our school feeding program, it's an important part of our human development agenda. By tackling the broader issues of eradication of poverty, uh, food and nutrition security, uh, and increasing school enrollment, the homegrown school feeding program has proved to be one of the most important uh, social investment programs that we have. What, what we do is that every day we provide lunch for 9.2 million children in 26 states of the Federation every single day. Now these children, these children are in 49,237 public schools across the country. In, in the 26 states. And so far, we appoint about 95,422 cooks and over 100,000 smallholder farms are linked to the program supplying locally sourced ingredients. Now, some of the, some of the figures per week, some of the figures per week, I mean, we, so it means that we kill about, and that's across the country, 594 cows every week, 138,000 chickens, 6.8 million eggs and 83 metric tons of fish every single week. Now, of course, there are multiplier implications and we haven't and we have not covered 36 states. So far, we've gone only, we've only covered 26 states. Well, we still have 10 states to go before we cover the entire country. As you can imagine, the quantity of starch, vegetables uh, required for the program on a weekly basis is also very high. Dietary energy and nutrients, you know, uh, are part of the important issues that are associated with this program. We also have a deworming program as part of the homegrown school feeding program. One of the key things that we've tried to address with our homegrown school feeding program is really the whole question of malnutrition. And many of us, of course, who are familiar with this, know that this is one of the major problems that extreme poverty has brought upon us and has brought upon countries like ours, where there are so many poor. What it means for many uh, young children, especially those between the ages of zero and six or so, is that where they are malnourished at those, uh, in that age bracket, they become stunted in their growth, their mental growth and it usually is irreversible. So unless we're able to provide uh, some circle, some food for them, some uh, good nutrition for them, at those, uh, especially in that age bracket, we will lose practically millions of young Nigerians 
who will be stunted in their mental growth and who will remain stunted for the rest of their lives. So this program is particularly important for us and we intend to expand it and to take it even to the preschool early education uh, as much as possible. Now, aside from uh, the homegrown school feeding, of course, uh, I've talked already about conditional cash transfers, etc. And I'm not going to take any more of your time. I've already mentioned uh, the education, uh, uh, education program, national health insurance. I don't think I've mentioned that. But I hope you'll be able to get copies of that. I really think that I mustn't uh, delay you much further because I could really hold you here for uh, <laughs> next time. Next time you'll be careful not to invite a professor and a pastor. Uh, next time you wouldn't do so. But I, I, I just want to mention, just as I close, I'll mention uh, the, the educational, our, our educational system and the plans that we have. I already talked about about it. But I think one of the very important issues uh, is that we cannot support, uh, there is no prosperity for a nation without an educational system that is able to sustain not just, uh, the, the, not just the jobs that will, uh, that will emerge from that economy or that will, that, will, that, that will be necessary. But also, it is important that we are able to have an educational system that takes care of practically everyone, all of the children that are growing up. Today we have all sorts of figures. We have uh, uh, out of school children, some say uh, 10 million, some say it's increased and all of that. But one of the critical things that, we'll, that we are doing as a government is, first of all, we understand the problem. When you talk about out, out of school children, you are talking about mainly primary school children. Now, primary school education is run by states, as you know, states, the local government. They run primary school education. Now, there is no way by which the federal government by itself can solve the problem of out-of-school children because each state runs its own primary school uh, system. As a matter of fact, if you look at the figures, uh, you will find that there is such disparity between out-of-school children, say, in Lagos State, and out-of-school children in Bauchi State, out-of-school children in Anambra State. That's a disparity, huge disparity in the actual numbers. So what we've tried to do at the level of the National Economic Council, which I have the privilege of chairing, the governors will meet every month, and we've looked at each state. So there's almost what we call a name and shame. So we pick a state and say, now how come you have uh, 100,000 primary school children that are not going to school? How come you have 300,000? How come you have 400,000? What can we do to resolve this problem? Then, as I said, there's a huge variety or in, the, in, in, the, in the actual numbers. But what it is is that we simply have to compel the states to provide more resources for education. Also healthcare, because primary healthcare, of course, as you know, is state-run. So we really have to provide, we have to ensure that the states provide more resources and that we back the states as much as we can with resources for, uh, for, edu for education and healthcare. There's no, what, 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 what I've seen is that obviously in the next few years we will resolve uh, the problem of out of school children. Uh, but I, my, 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 my greater worry is with respect to the quality of education, the quality of education, which of course talk, speaks to the question of teacher training, the quality of teachers, how do you get the best quality of teachers. And that's why you know, one of the big uh, projects that we're doing with the states is the whole question of uh, revamping teacher training. How do we revamp teacher training? How can we ensure that teachers are not just better trained, but trained in the particular skills that are relevant, especially uh, digital literacy skills, and those skills that are relevant for the immediate future. So there's a lot of attention being paid uh, to that at the moment. As a matter of fact, uh, there are, if you look at our educational program, there are three broad pillars of that, of that program, and all of them address uh, questions of how 
to uh, how to ensure that we are first we adequately resource teacher training and in this uh, respect where the federal government of course is going to back the states give resources add resources to what they have to be able to resource teacher training but also to develop the kinds of classrooms the kinds of accommodation that we need now because if you look at what is required i mean a lot of what is required for digital training and all of that uh, you know the classrooms have need special equipment there's a need for us to, to to bring in special equipment but fortunately for us there's a lot there, there there's a lot of help coming from practically everywhere and equipment is getting cheaper and cheaper not more expensive as a matter of fact what we've seen is that we can using uh, some of the tools that are already available train more train faster than ever before and we think that if we uh, focus on some of the work uh, that has been done elsewhere, especially large uh, populations like India and all of that, we'll be able to do, uh, we'll be able to move even much faster. But the other uh, point with respect to education is girl-child education, as the education of, of, of young women, or the ed education of girls. That is a major problem. If you look at the number of out-of-school children, the sig most significant portion of that, of course, is girls who are, who are not uh, going to school. And if you look at some of the figures of those who have not gone to school and who are uh, over the age of 15 already, it really is quite startling. But we must uh, do everything that, we need, that needs to be done. Some of it is cultural, some of it is you know, early marriages and all of that. But we think that now there's, a great, there's more attention being paid to ensuring that young girls are going to school. A lot of the governors, uh, especially in the states where uh, this has proved to be a problem, are far more willing than ever before to commit to girl-child education. And everyone knows that if, if, if girls are educated, they wouldn't, they wouldn't marry as early as they marry. That will also affect population. Already we are, we are all panicking about our population, which we are going to be the uh, third or so most populous country uh, in the whole world by 2050. So everybody's panicking about that. But if you, if you actually improve girl-child education, we can reduce our population considerably. Because all of the studies show that um, educated uh, young women have fewer children than uh, the illiterate or uneducated ones. So that at least is one way of ensuring that we're able to also deal with the, with the population issues. But so those are some of the uh, broad uh, questions and issues that we have to address. So uh, just to end, I'd like to say that our country is set for, our country is set for progress. There's no question at all that our country can prosper. If we stay the course, our problem has never been uh, ideas, our problem has never been plans, our problem has always been how to ensure that we implement those plans and that we do what we say we'll do. And I, I, I think that um, uh, President Muhammad Buhari, as I always say, is not an orator, but he's a well-known doer. And I think that this one we will do by God's grace. Thank you very much.